First off, I want to thank everybody who's attending tonight, both participants and our panelists and our moderator for being patient where we had some technical issues on the side. We do sincerely apologize for that. Uh, it looks like we have a decent amount of people who have joined us right now, so we'll go ahead and begin our session a little bit behind, but my presentation will be very quick, and then we can get on to hearing from our participants, uh, our panelists, and our moderator. So my name is John Raza. Let me show you my screen. I'm an admissions officer with Harvard Divinity School Admissions. Uh, I've been in this role since October 2nd, but I've been with the Office of Admissions since uh, 2019 as the staff assistant. It's very nice to meet you all tonight. We'll give a little bit of background about Harvard Divinity School. Harvard Divinity School was founded in 1816, and HDS is the first divinity school in the United States and the most religiously pluralistic in the world. There are over 45 different faith traditions represented at HDS right now. HDS educates students in the academic study of religion in preparation for ethical leadership, religious literacy, and service-oriented, mission-driven work. Our vision is to provide an intellectual home where scholars from around the globe teach varieties of religion in service of a just world at peace. Subject of tonight's session will be the Master of Religion and Public Life, the MRPL. This is a program that is designed for experienced professionals in primarily, but not exclusively, secular arenas whose work is focused on having a positive social impact and who are inspired by a vision of just peace. The MRPL degree offers, sorry, the MRPL degree offers, provides an opportunity for experienced professionals Sorry, everybody. The MRPL degree provides an opportunity for experienced professionals to become leaders in their fields who can help foster a better public understanding of religion and address the religious dimensions of some of the most difficult issues of our time. Specifically, the MRPL degree allows professionals to gain advanced knowledge about religion through coursework, a shared seminar with other professionals, and a final project that will contribute to a deepening understanding of religion within their fields. In terms of the components of the MRPL by the numbers, this is a one-year full-time degree program that is in residence. There are no online or remote options provided. There are three required courses as part of the MRPL, those being theories and methods in the study of religion, and a full-year MRPL Religion and Public Life Seminar, which is listed as MRPL Seminar Part 1 in the fall, and MRPL Seminar Part 2 in the spring. There is one final project requirement, Students must complete a final project that engages the topic of religion within their profession. This can take the form of a portfolio addressing a particular theme in the intersection of religion and the student's profession, two smaller papers, each normally 20 to 30 pages in length, or one large paper, normally 40 to 60 pages in length. There is also an oral examination and public presentation requirement as well. Very quickly, we'll address how to apply for the MRPL. We'll start at the bottom of our slide with our timeline. The application is open. It opened on September 12th of 2023. It will close at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard on January 4th. In late January and throughout February, interviews will begin to be issued and all admission decisions are released in mid-March. In terms of how to apply, You'll need to provide the following components, just the application form, just available online. You'll need to provide a project proposal. Um, the project proposal should factor, should provide some preliminary thoughts on their intended MRPL project, the applicant's intended MRPL project. Will require a resume, that's between one and two pages. Unofficial academic transcripts for every post-secondary institution you've attended. Will require three letters of recommendation, We'll require a writing sample, no more than 1,500 words, five to seven pages, 12-point type. We'll require the TOEFL or IELTS exams if applicable. If you have any questions about whether or not that's applicable to you, please reach out to us using the information on the following slide. We'll also be issuing interviews. An interview is required in order to be admitted to HDS, but critically, an interview invitation is not a guarantee of admission to HDS. To wrap this up, 
In order to stay connected with HDS admissions, we would love to have any questions you have about app admissions procedures, application components, or things of that nature. Please don't hesitate to send those to admissions at hds.harvard.edu. If you'd like to speak with a current student, you can send any inquiries you have to ask underscore students at hds.harvard.edu. We have information on our blog below that, and we always love it when people follow us at Harvard Divinity on Instagram. In the upper right corner, you'll see a QR code that links to our Connect form, which will allow you to receive email updates if you want to know more about upcoming informational events, application updates, and things like that. With that, I'll hand this over to our moderator, Professor Diane Moore, Faculty Director, Religion and Public Life, Lecturer in Religion, Conflict and Peace, our wonderful student panelists, and our special guest who will self-introduce. Uh, I am very honored to turn the floor over to Professor Moore. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, and I am especially honored to be in this conversation with colleagues who are current students and one of our alumnix uh, from last year. So I'm gonna ask all of you all to come on screen as well. And John, I think we can come off screen uh, of the uh, screen share if you can, so we can see each other's faces. So uh, I'm Diane Moore. I'm the Associate Dean of Religion and Public Life here, and I have the incredible honor of, um, of uh, teaching the and running the MRPL program and the MRPL seminar, which is one of uh, two, two of the three required courses for the MRPL degree. Tonight, we're going to be hearing primarily from participants in the program. Again, Austin, who who graduated last year and three of our current students who in a moment, I will ask them to introduce themselves. I'm gonna say just a couple words about the program uh, and its inception. Uh, this is the third year of the MRPL. So it's a, it's a new degree program, the first new degree here at the Divinity School in over 50 years. And for all of us here in the faculty, the thing we were most felt most excited about relevant to, um, to the program is that we wanted uh, to offer something that is not readily available in other spaces. And we felt like we had the resources here on the faculty and at Harvard University to offer a program for experienced professionals, people who've been in fields and have established themselves in particular fields in a, a variety of different contexts. Uh, that can be professions, it can be artists, it can be organizers. So we have a wide range of of, uh, of people who have come through the program um, relevant to their professional arenas, but people who have experience in a field who feel like they are committed to uh, making positive social change in the world and feel like coming to our program would enhance the work that they are already doing in a way that will um, be meaningful for the next phase of their work in their vocation. So it's an unusual program in both its focus on uh, people in uh, arenas outside of religion, although not exclusively, so quote unquote secular professions, but it's also unusual in the sense that we have a normative commitment to building a just world at peace. And what that means is widely interpreted in a variety of different ways, but we are, eager to impact the world in positive ways and to address some of the most urgent and critical challenges of our time. And uh, so for us, it is really a marriage of vocation, a sense of purpose, a sense of professional experience, and a, and a sense of, of vision to, um, to, to make positive social change, to impact the world in a positive way. The other dimension of the program that is unusual is that it's a cohort driven program. So the one of the, the probably the biggest strength of the program uh, is the opportunity to work with other remarkable professionals um, who will join you uh, if you if you apply and are admitted, who would be your colleagues throughout the journey for the year. And the cohorts are always intentionally small. We only admit up to 16 or maybe 17 people in a given year. Um, and then, and that, so it's a small group of people who work very closely together throughout the year to, um, to be able to imagine, enact, and engage with the project that they came to pursue while they're here in, in, in conversation with each other and in conversation with 
their coursework throughout uh, the Divinity School and throughout Harvard. So just a brief a brief overview, but I'm going to turn it over now and ask um, each of you individually to uh, to say to say to first of all introduce yourself to say who you are and what your own professional arena is. Um, and I'm going to ask this first question of of my colleagues here. What uh, after you introduce yourself, if you could also then say what drew you to the Divinity School. And why did you end up choosing the MRPL degree program uh, amidst all the other options that are that are here? And I'll just go through and ask you to sit one at a time here. And I'm going to start with you, Austin, our alumnix from last year. So Austin, thanks again for being with us and say hi to the group and, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to, to the to HDS uh, to a year ago, a year, a year and a half ago now uh, for you. Um, I'll go. So please turn it over to you, Austin. Yeah, it just seems like the other day. Uh, yeah. So I'm Austin Bogues. I'm a journalist. Um, I think what brought me to the Divinity School was I started off here at Harvard as a Neiman Fellow, and um, I was studying polarization uh, in the United States uh, here in our political system. And um, I was inspired by two courses that I took uh, with two professors um, at the Divinity School with uh, Dr. Kimberly C. Patton and uh, Professor K. Healing Gaston. Um, they challenged me to look at polarization and some of you know the root drivers of it uh, in the country a little bit differently and from a more religious perspective and uh, kind of looking at the roles, uh, faith and like kind of religious and people understand uh, what we call today uh, modern uh political polarization. So that's what inspired me to come back here uh, to Harvard as a student and uh, take kind of a deeper dive uh, into some of the problems going on in uh, society. Great. Thanks so much, Austin. I'm going to I'm going to turn now to you, Josh. Uh, please say hi, introduce yourself. And uh, what made you uh, come? What drew you to the Divinity School in this program? Hi, everybody. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'm Josh. Um, I've been doing um, a variety of different uh, political communications um, and progressive organizing work. Um, I'm obviously calling you from the corona of the sun um, right now, um, <laughs> but uh, I was drawn to um, Harvard Divinity School. Actually, I was drawn to uh, the MRPL program, I would have to say, before Harvard Divinity School. Um, I, uh, in undergrad, um, st studied both religion and political science um, and have had a, a really strong interest in religion for a long time, but I was not looking to do um, a graduate school program um, at this point in my career. Um, but looking at the Master of Religion and Public Life, um, looking at both the interdisciplinary work and the ability to um, take a year away and look at both my, my own professional work um, in the context of religious studies and have a chance to reflect on that and build um, on the work that uh, I was already doing um, and come back, you know, sort of bridge that um, the academic and the professional and practical um, was incredibly appealing to me. Um, and so when I heard about the program, um, I was really interested uh, in joining and um, found a, a whole wonderful community here at HDS, which I'm sure we'll talk about more um, over the course of the panel as well. It's great to be here. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Josh. And Raisa, I'm going to turn it to you. Uh, say hi, please, and tell us about yourself and what brought you here. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, I feel like by saying hello to all of you, I'm also saying hello to myself in October of last year. And I remember watching this webinar like in the car. Um, I'm Raisa. I, um, I'm a poet. I uh, Before I came to this program, a lot of my work was looking at women fighters and boxers through a poetic lens. Um, and I really found myself at a pivotal sort of turning point in my career. I had known this one way of working um, as a writer in a sort of literary profession. Um, and I was really interested and curious and thinking about like how else, how else can I work? How can poetry be a tool for just peace, be a tool for deep listening? Um, so I was really drawn to this program because uh, I was interested in my field of of literature and writing as also um, the method that I was working in, but I wanted to know new ways of working in that in that uh, field. So I was really called to think about literary chaplaincy, to think about um, this cohort model of what can I learn um, in community about those questions. Um, yeah. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Raisa. And Mario, last but not at all least, um, please say hi, hey. introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I am normally from Miami, <laughs> except this year. Uh, I worked at Viacom CBS for about 20 years. I was senior vice president of social impact campaigns. We dealt with every issue you can possibly imagine from way in the days of HIV AIDS to human trafficking to teen pregnancy, to domestic violence, to gender, race, and sexual rights and equity. The one thing that we did not touch was religion. And it was always, uh, a, for me, uh, a question mark. Why is it that we don't address religion? And I found out that uh, Harvard Divinity School has this program, uh, the Masters of Religion in Public Life, that helps professionals understand religion. Um, I personally did not want to study religion, but I wanted to understand religion so that I could create a campaign, a social impact campaign that deals with both, right? Entertainment and entertainment media and religion. And this is the only program uh, of its kind. Uh, there isn't anything like that in the US or anywhere else in the world, as far as I know. Um, so I took the plunge and came over for the year and I'm very happy. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you again, all of you for, for being here and you and the audience for taking time to learn about, about what we're, we're, we're um, our aspirations are here for this program and for your interest in HDS and the MRPL. Let me just say a couple other introductory comments about what we mean. We're going to hear a lot. You're going to hear about uh, religious literacy. Um, the underlying assumption in, of the program is that there is widespread lack of understanding about religion in public conversation. And that is not because people aren't intelligent or are capable, but there are very, very few avenues for people outside of their own faith traditions or the media to learn about religion in any uh, formal way. And we are deeply uh, committed to providing opportunities for people to learn about um, the power of religion and the way it functions in human experience, uh, both positively and negatively, because the lack of understanding about religion uh, fuels bigotry and prejudice and hinders opportunities for collaborative, uh, cooperative engagements across a, a wide array of possibilities in local, national, and global contexts. So we actually believe that what we call religious illiteracy or a lack of understanding about religion is not just a neutral or a, not a value add, but it's a detriment to being able to engage um, responsibly in the challenging civic questions of our time. And so our, our commitment to advancing the public understanding of religion in service of a just world at peace is the mission statement for religion and public life here at Harvard Divinity School and the MRPL program as a part of religion and public life. So again, we, we have a, a deep commitment to giving people and students who come through our program language and tools to be able to understand the complexities of how religions are functioning, especially in quote unquote secular arenas of our lives. We challenge the notion that religion and secularism uh, is a, itself a binary. You'll learn that that's not the case. It's not a binary. Religion is deeply implicated in what we call secular arenas. We're giving people language and tools to understand this power and then to be able to imagine new possibilities for how to, um, how to harness that power to, uh, to create and to help contribute to uh, building a just world at peace. So that's our that's our work. So we have a representative sample here in the room of different kinds of the kinds of people who have come through the program or are attracted to the program. I just want to say, just to give you another, we could have the whole cohort from the and the cohorts from the last two years here. I would love. I wish we had time for you to to for you to meet all of the the people who have come through this program so far. But we also have um, in this in this current cohort, we have um, a Hollywood agent, someone who's working in Hollywood as as an agent. We have um, we have two lawyers who are working in different kinds of arenas. Uh, we have uh, a couple other people who are engaged in organizing along with Josh in different kinds of sectors. We have a professional chef who's interested in promoting what it means to think about 
whole life living uh, through uh, a, a, a vegan focused um, lifestyle. Uh, and we have a novelist who uh, is an accomplished novelist who has been um, uh, who is writing a new project relevant to um, to re related to what she's she's learning here in our in our time. Last year we had um, a military chaplain in the Navy. We had uh, two corporate executives. Uh, we also had another um, community organizer uh, that was in in Austin's class. Uh, we had a, 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 a expert in media technology who um, was a former uh, exec, former uh, leader in um, in Meta, formerly Facebook. So we the the range of different expertise that people have brought to us has been astonishing, and we at the Divinity School have learned so much from all of you and your peers who've come through this program. We, through the pro project, we realized we have something really, what we hope is really important to offer you, which is language about how to understand the complexity of religion. But you all, you all bring to us your expertise in your arenas, which we do not know. And it is that collaboration, that partnership of what we can offer and what you teach us, and then the translation of this work to broader audiences, which is what our commitment is in the program, and what our vision is for the program, so that people who come through and are with us for a year, um, this is the beginning of our relationship with all of you, um, and not the end. It really is the beginning, and then we are creating and forming and uh, engaging with these larger networks of people who are now graduates of this program, whom we stay connected to, uh, both and continue to learn from and offer resources to them for their own work in advancing um, the public understanding of religion through their professions uh, in service of a just world at peace. So this is this is our vision for this work. This is our great, my great honor to be in a room with people like those who are here tonight um, and potentially with those of you in the audience who are interested in sharing um, and, and joining us in, in this in this particular this through this particular very unique pro this unique program uh, with the um, with the hopes and aspirations if you if you share them we're very excited to have further conversations with all of you. So with that though, I'm going to ask another couple questions, and um, and so you get to hear from again people who've been through the program. I can I can blabber on for a long time about what I hope will happen in this program, but uh, it's actually what ends up happening from the people who've been in it and are currently in it that is going to be most useful for you. So my next question for all of you in in the room is: What were the pro personal or professional goals specifically that led you to choose? the MRPL program um, specifically, if, if you can speak about that again, related to your profession. And I'm gonna just jump around here a little. Mario, let's go ahead and start with you with this question. Sure, thank you. Uh, my personal and professional goal is to hopefully be able to create a, a program for media executives, specifically for Hollywood screenwriters to understand, like I wanted to understand, how religion plays a role in our lives in a very implicit way. Because the way that I've been looking at films and television since I started to think about this program, I realized that we uh, in Hollywood and uh, the screenwriters, we use a lot of religion without even thinking uh, uh, in, unintentionally. And I think it's important to create an awareness that we are using it and eventually, hopefully, we can also find the so what question. So, you know, so what if we're using it? But that's maybe next year. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. Uh, Josh. Yeah, so I uh, I think I professionally, um, my goal coming into the program um, was to come away with some um, concrete strategies. My background um, was in, you know, political organizing, like I said, but specifically in um, political communications um, and organizing. And that was that was the mode through which I operated. I've worked on, um, you know, statewide electoral campaigns. I've worked with labor unions. Um, I worked in the Massachusetts State House for a while. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really felt like, particularly after the last campaign that I was on, um, was that we lacked the tools um, to actually connect with people 
um, on a deeper level, particularly um, from a progressive political lens. Um, you know, we're very good at talking about policy um, and uh, not particularly good um, at talking about much else um, as, a, as a movement. Um, and so, you know, my goal in, in coming here professionally was to, you know, look at and develop um, strategies that I could take back. Um, to help, you know, make our movements more heart-centered, um, to make them connect better um, with people, and also better understand um, the modes and worldviews that people are already operating within, um, so that we can, you know, connect with them and find language, um, and not just language, but stories, values, understanding to better connect with them. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll also say on, on a personal level, um, you know, this is also uh, a really meaningful time to um, reflect on why I'm doing this work. Um, you know, I like uh, I uh, had previously um, considered coming to the program and then got sucked into um, a different political campaign um, and ended up uh, reapplying. It's a long story. Don't do what I did. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm very glad that I'm here. Um, and the reason that I came back was um, all, you know, because of the professional reasons that I talked about, but also because um, I wanted to figure I needed to reground myself in the work. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years and a lot longer than that. I've been doing political organizing for most of my life. Um, and, you know, finding what it is, you know, not just for other people, but I realized also for myself um, in motivating me was important. Um, but, you know, those two things are very tied for me. I don't know that they're tied for everybody, um, but the the strategic questions are very important to me on a personal level as well. Um, so that's that's what I was looking for. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, beautifully stated. I'm glad you I'm glad you stuck with it and decided to come back. <laughs> um, Raisa, uh, love to hear your thoughts on this question. Yeah, I think, Diana, when I spoke to you at the very beginning, I really one thing I really was thinking about was I had worked as a poet, I had worked in the Larry world, and I started to move away and start to create these poetry listening sites. And I was really interested in looking at poetry as like this really on the ground tool, um, which is really different than what I had been doing. And I think part of working in this new way where I was setting up my typewriter and um, listening in all these different spaces was also asking like, what is this work and how is it working and where can it have application? And I think I, I, I said I needed help in seeing that, that I wanted other eyes and other perspectives and other like a wide range, people with expertise in a wide range of fields um, to help me see and learn in different ways. Um, I, I think that there's this cross pollination that happens where I had been in this field where I was working with poets, thinking with poets, um, and now I'm in this cohort where we're thinking and existing in all these different kinds of ways. Um, and that has been a huge gift to, um, to see differently, to um, see my blind spots. And I, I think that's deeply transformative. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. What, perfect. Um, and Austin, love, love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. So I've been working as a journalist now, really one way or the other, since I was 14 years old and, you know, working for my uh, my student newspaper. Um, I, I think what I really wanted to do professionally was kind of take a step back, um, see some of the larger dynamics and structures and uh, kind of take a deep look at some of the things I wanted to get more expertise on. And, um, you know, that's something I was able to get from, you know, the whole Harvard community. Um and, you know, just attend the seminars, the lectures, and, and really just kind of do the what we call the deep learning, you know, and, um, you know, look at journalism and the intersection of scholarship and um, kind of, you know, take all journalism is so kind of uh, bite driven. So, you know, kind of um, confined in some ways by space or, you know, um, time. But what I really wanted to do is just take a step back and, and really take a deep dive into some of the, the topics around polarization, um, you know, kind of the, the drivers of uh, uh, political polarization uh, in the country. Great, thank you. Thank you, Austin. So uh, 
this so so part of the what you're hearing everyone in the, of those who are um who are observing us who are part of this conversation you're hearing what it means to have people who have been again immersed in and experts in particular arenas who um who choose to want to come here for this one year program to do exactly what um, what you're hearing folks do, coming in with a plan, coming in with a project. You apply to this program with a project in mind relevant to your profession. But I can say right now that for virtually everyone who comes into the into the program, what you apply, the project you apply with, shifts pretty dramatically once you're here and start learning about religion in the fresh ways that we're inviting you to consider. So the, the idea to have a project is really critical because you have to have a framework to then enter into what it means to come into this space. Uh, but a couple of things I, I say to, to people as they're pondering whether this is the right program for them. Remember that all of you, all of the people who come into this program are experienced professionals. Um, if you can do the project you wanna do without um, coming to this program, then you should find uh, an opportunity to get funding to take a year off to go do that. This program is not necessarily for people who could re who just need time, just need time to do a project, because that would be a type of sabbatical or a type of potential fellowship for some people, uh, or just a year off of support for you uh, in your professional arenas to do something that you really want to do and could do right now, but just need time. This program is not really then for you. The program that this would feed will be people who have a project in mind and who also have this drive to feel like there is something else that's missing relevant to what they're hoping to try to do, that they feel like this the, a more um, capacious study of religion, immersion into a study of religion in all of its power and complexity can help give them language to understand something relevant to their work. And so in that regard, we, again, that's back to us having something to offer you, but also you having something to share with us. And it's that, it's that synergy that creates the conditions for people to come in with a project in mind that often shifts, not always, but often will shift in focus relevant to, again, once you start to have the opportunity to do the learning that you came here to do. So I wanted to just tweak that and say thanks for those comments that, again, I think helps solidify the distinctiveness of this kind of program from other types of opportunities that professionals might want to pursue at um, at this at experienced professionals might want to pursue for a year of engagement with an idea or a project. So another question for all of you. I'm, I'm curious, is there anything specifically that you've learned or an Austin that you learned uh, uh, the, for those of you who are just here, that we're only here for we've only been here a couple months, so we're still at the early part of of a year long program. Is there anything specific that you've learned about religion that surprised or inspired you, or helped you think about your own work in new ways? Um, and I'm gonna just let I'm not gonna ask all of you to respond to that because that might not be a relevant question to all of you. But for anyone who would like to respond to that, please just jump right in, um, and we'd love to hear your answer. Mario, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, um, so far what has struck me the most is the importance of nuance in religion, which again, I've never studied religion before, uh, but this is very important because nuance on screen can make a big difference. Uh -huh. And I had not thought about that if I was gonna be developing a training for Hollywood screenwriters. Okay, nuance. Thank you. Really, a uh, really critical, especially in a conversation in our public discourse about religion, which is absolutely so stark and simplistic. So the the ability to understand nuance and complexity is is really is what we offer. I'm glad you found you're finding that helpful. It's really really key. Um, anyone else want to take on that question? Raisa, go ahead. Thank you. I feel myself in May like looming over me right now as I answer this with a completely <laughs> different answer. But I will say that like right now, today, what I'm thinking about is um, we've learned a lot about violence and different kinds of violence and the way violence shows up. And um, we recently have been talking about the moral imagination and um, 
ways of holding and thinking in new creative ways. And I've learned so much already about the way art and poetry helps us think and connect in ways that can perhaps create space around these really um, pervasive forms of violence that occur in all different kinds of ways. It's helped me see those ways um, more clearly, more distinctly so that I can attend to them. Wonderful, wonderful, which is also why we are so grateful to have a poet such as yourself bring your skills as a poet to um, to this imaginative sphere. So thank you. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when uh, way back when I studied political science and religion in undergrad, um, I uh, was under the distinct impression um, that I was a political science person who was going to study religion um, and use that information um, to accomplish my political goals. Um, and the thing that I very quickly discovered um, in doing that was that it was entirely the other way around. Um, that in understanding um, religion, the formations of religion, um, looking at our political systems um, and the ways that uh, our, you know, our systems have grown and, and evolved and the structures that have evolved, um, it radically changed at that point in time, um, my sense of um, what I actually wanted and needed to do politically and became the primary driver for me. Um, you would think that when I applied to this program, I would have had now that at the front of my mind. Um, and yet again, here I was um, showing up at this program thinking to myself, uh, I have political goals um, and I'm going to go and I'm going to learn from religion and I'm going to be able to put those in service to my political goals. Um, and lo and behold, shockingly, the, you know, the same thing happened again here where, um, you know, being able to look at where our systems come from, how they come from, and being able to step out of a lot of the assumptions that come with being in the, you already heard, quote unquote, secular um, society and being able to look at and analyze those changed the way for me that I think about those things and how to approach those problems. Um, so that's been enormously valuable to me already. And we're six weeks in. So. Wonderful. I, I, you're, you're reminding me of something that you all in the room have heard me say too many times. So apologies to you, but that so much of what we are also inviting people to do is to think about what w coming into a program and really understanding through the lens of religious literacy, deeper understandings of the power of religion is also to invite people into a process of learning, a process of just peace building, as opposed to a destination. And that process is, is to help shift the paradigm, to help people realize that we to build a just world at peace requires that we be in different kinds of conversations uh, with people that we otherwise often don't have conversations with and to be together creating something uh, that is again about building something as opposed to um, having a, a, something that is concretely defined that we just have to construct. And that is a really important piece. So Josh, your comment is beautiful because it's, it is about you, 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 you're in a process and you're open yourself to a process of learning, which I will say takes a particular kind of courage, which I um, really, really respect and respect in the, everyone in the room carries, holds that courage because your experienced professionals open to asking questions about what you don't know. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and I'm just incredibly honored to be in the conversations with all of you who are engaged in that process. So thank you. And Austin, I don't know, is, that, is this a question you want to take on or should we move on? It's up to you. Sure. I mean, you know, maybe after a year of study here, you know, again, just kind of to echo with some of the, the comments that have been made before, religion manifests in a lot of places where, you know, again, we, we think of as being secular or, you know, just being kind of separate and apart from what we think about as being uh, religious spaces in our in our dialogue with one another and you know some of you know even to looking at things like infrastructure or uh you know um there, there's all sorts of uh spaces where we see religion really manifest uh, i studied you know apocalyptic rhetoric in our political system 
uh, during the, in some of the origins of it. Uh, and, you know, just seeing how, you know, both on the political left and the right and everywhere in between, you know, you'll see some of this rhetoric uh, manifest. So it, it was just really eye opening. Uh, and it's always been there with the history of this country. So it's really interesting to just kind of take a deep dive. So much of, you know, I feel the program in, in HDS is teaching you, you know, what you don't know, you don't know. And that's where the deep learning is really able to um, take place. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful responses, wonderful reflections. I'm going to I'm going to ask now this question. I think that everyone in the audience will be very happy to hear, um, which is uh, what's a piece of advice you'd offer someone contemplating this program uh, at Harvard Divinity School? Austin, I'll, I'll, we'll go backwards here. Let, let's go ahead and start with you. Piece of advice for people who are thinking about this program. Uh, get ready to read. Um, you know, get ready to read. There's a lot of reading that takes place, um, and you know you'll 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 get help with that if that's a you know a problem. You know you get you get taught to learn to read strategically and to you know kind of uh, process information a little bit uh, more different. The other thing I would just say is I would encourage you to, you know, actively engage with, you know, both your cohort and with, um, you know, the HDS community at large. You, you know, you learn so much from the professors here, from, uh, you know, from the deans, you learn from the students a ton, you know, and the staff. And um, everyone just has unique talents and um, unique world perspectives. And, you know, the more the more you engage, the better you'll do here, you know, as a, just fully immerse yourself into the, the learning opportunities that are here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Josh. Yeah, so, I mean, I think um, I would just echo something that you said earlier, Diane, which is um, to really just think about what your goal, you know, as you're thinking about whether to come here and whether you want to do this program, to really think about what your goals are. Um, and, and what you want out of this, um, you know, this is an, an academic program, um, and it's one that goes really fast, um, too. Um, you know, I was joking about how we're six weeks in, but we're actually almost eight weeks in. So, um, it's going faster than I expect. So, you know, it goes fast, it's intensive, um, and that can be, you know, for me has been really incredible, um, but also can, can be difficult. Um, and, you know, requires focus and attention um, and, you know, a willingness to sort of like dive in up to your elbows in the, ac in the academic pieces too, to then be able to take them and translate them and make them, you know, accessible um, for yourself and for the communities that you're going back to. Um, and so, you know, really just echoing, Diane, I think what you said earlier about, you know, if, it, you know, I have a, a lot of different reasons that I'm here and things I want to get out of it, um, but making sure that like that's a lot, those things are aligned um, with what's ultimately an academic program will be really helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mario, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I would highly suggest you to sign up to as many newsletters as you can. Uh, on HDS and the religion and public life and any other programs that you may be interested. So that you, you can start getting used to the departments, the names, the lingo, um, and then use the resources that, that the school offers. I know Austin mentioned that, but I would like to make a, a very uh, big emphasis in use them before you arrive. Uh, talk to the there's there's groups of students like ourselves like alumni like Austin who are in a group where you can reach out to us uh, and ask questions what I wish I would have known um, before I started was that that group existed and I could actually reach out to ask questions about what classes could I take what do you recommend which class did you like why did you like it especially because there's two or three people uh, in the previous cohorts who are from Hollywood and they are in the media uh, and similar paths as mine. So it would have been great that I would have, I would have known that and I would have taken the initiative to have done that. Great, wonderful. Thank you. And Raisa. I'm thinking about where I was when I was contemplating right in October and I think Someone said to me the first week here that big moments of learning, it's a transformation and it's not a performance. And I've thought about that line so often of the way that 
being deeply transformed is messy. It is beautiful. It is joyful. It's difficult. And I think this program requires a real surrendering to that process of nine months. It's like everyone has echoed. It's really, um, you really give a lot to it. So um, I think the advice would be to really ask yourself, like, is that, am I wanting that, that kind of big breaking open change, transformation, support, resource? Um, am I wanting that kind of uh, experience? Um, and six weeks in, I can say it's worth it and it's challenging and it's, um, and it's uh, requires surrender. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Powerful comments from all of you. Thank you. Um, I, I really, I, I love the, I love how each of you spoke about what it means to be here and to everything from taking advantage to the multiple resources, as well as um, I'll pick up just on what you just said, Raisa. I will say that if, if a year here, if this program isn't transformational for you, then we have not done our jobs because it, 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 it's to, 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 to give up a year of your life, I will say for, for people in the MRPL program in particular, it means extracting yourself from profession, your professional commitments, many of you from your families for a year. Uh, it, means, it means having to do a lot of arranging to take a full year, nine months of full academic year away from your work, which I will also say, I really strongly advise people to do. People, almost everyone in the cohort is still connected to some form of their work, but it's a challenge uh, to, to do both. Um, and so we strongly advise you to do as much extraction of your, uh, of your other commitments as possible so that you can be fully present here in the ways that it really uh, requires to, to be able to have the deep immersive experience that we intend for you to have and hope that you will have. But I will say, um, it is, it, if it's not transformational, then again, I think we have not done our work uh, because it should be. It, because, of, because not only of the commitments it requires of all of you to come, but also because education should be transformational. It is not just a, a, a banking model of you know, information that you end up storing. It is about what does it mean to ask big and difficult questions? What does it mean to be... Um, to be agents of change in an incredibly complex and polarized world where much is at stake, um, to actually jump into, not away from, some of the most urgent and challenging questions and issues of our time. That's what we will be inviting you to do here in community. And that work um, is and, and should be trans transformational. And I will say it is transformational for us here as well. So this is not about us at Harvard, the faculty inviting you into something that we're watching you go through transformation. We are transformed by your presence here. And it is an incredible gift because this is what the world requires of us now. Uh, it is uh, incredibly important. All of us at HDS feel like uh, our work in the academy has got to speak meaningfully to the challenges of our times in a variety of different ways but that is something I share with all my colleagues here. And I'm very proud to say that. Um, and students who come here help us do that work, help us fulfill our vocational work, uh, thanks to the commitments and the visions and the, um, the courage that you all are bringing. So I will answer a few questions that are here in the chat and a few that were asked ahead of time. Um, and then if we, we might have another couple minutes, I will say, this video will be available. So that was one of the questions. Um, it'll be available for all of you to, to review if you're interested, if you are in the room and for people who weren't able to join us, um, it, it will be available. And, um, and we're grateful to all of you in the room for, uh, for allowing that to be a public, to allowing this video to go public. Um, there's a couple um, questions about whether people can transfer in from the MRPL into the MDiv or the MTS. I will say, please don't enter the MRPL unless you feel like this is your program. Because first of all, you the, you cannot transfer across uh, those two uh, fields. And they're really different programs. MTS program, Master of Theological Studies, the Master of Divinity, those are the Master of Theological Studies is a two-year program. Master of Divinity is a three-year program. I'm happy 
uh, to talk to anyone who's seriously wanting to consider applying to this program, uh, please reach out to me directly. I will schedule a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you to make sure that this program is the right fit for you. And I'm happy to help you go through that discernment after you've know, after you've gone through the basic information about what the program is, because um, it is a unique program uh, and there are no transfers. I will, I'll just wanna say that. The other thing that I think is just important to say, uh, there's also no financial aid except for loans for this program. We wouldn't be able to offer the program if we did have financial aid. Our other two programs have financial aid opportunities, very generous ones. So if that's a concern for you, then I would strongly encourage you to look at the MTS or the MDiv program. But we cannot offer financial aid for this Master of Religion and Public Life program, except for student loans, which are uh, available to any, any, any enrolled student. So we can talk more about that if that's of interest. Um, there is a lot of interaction with other uh, programs at the Divinity School. So the third course that you're required to take, the, the cohort is uh, the Master uh, of Religion and Public Life Seminar is just with the cohort for the whole year. But the third course you take is the um, Theories and Methods in the Study of Religion. And that is uh, required of all the students in, in, uh, in, in the school that are in any of the other master's programs. So you'll be in a class with MDiv, MTS, first year MDiv, MTS, and, um, and the cohort itself has its own section, but you'll be engaging with other students in, um, in, that, in that class. And then you have other classes that you take uh, with other students. Um, so the other classes you take will be um, usually not with members of the cohort. So you have a lot of opportunities for interaction. Um, and a couple other questions. Uh, a just world at peace here today a few times. Could you unpack what that practically means at HDS? Um, no, I can't uh, fully. <laughs> but I can say what I said earlier, which uh, the components would be looking at, I will, I will say this. What we mean uh, in the religion public life program around that and 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 also parts of HDS is a just world at peace means that there cannot be peace in the world without justice. And that the two are really married. And with that context, then an analysis of power is central to the work that we do here at HDS. And so. Um, Peace is not just the absence of conflict. Peace is about looking at a world where the structural injustices that continue to be replicated, I, we will believe here often unintentionally, unwittingly, but, but the replication of structural injustice and structural inequity is itself um, the biggest barrier to peace. And um, with structural inequity, there cannot be ever lasting peace. But we actually also believe here that lasting peace is a possibility. It's not necessarily a probability, but it's a possibility. And it takes a moral imagination and it takes courage and it takes a commitment to imagine a world and then help create a world where just peace can prevail. So the other piece that would be a component of just peace building is what I said earlier which is about a process. It's not like you, you figure, oh, this is what just peace is and then we uh, re impose it. <laughs> um, just peace becomes a process. It's an aspiration, if you will, with a vision and a goal and a constant, uh, what we call praxis, action and then reflection on the action to see if you are actually representing the praxis or the aspiration that you're, um, you, that you're committed to. And doing that in community with um, with a variety of different people that is both itself part, sometimes challenging, but ultimately phenomenally rewarding about what it means to shift and create new paradigms for ways to be in the world and ways to think that might actually help us out of the terrible challenges um, and vicious cycles of violence that we find ourselves um immersed in both through challenging political questions of these days, not just here in the US, but globally, but also the, the crisis itself of climate collapse um, and what we're facing globally uh, as, a, as a world community around um, 
our exploitation of the Earth's resources. What does that mean? How do we tackle those questions meaningfully, creatively, without creating another uh, binary of right, wrong, good, bad, zero sum uh, 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 ways to understand the world, which these binaries are now very, very um, uh, deeply, unfortunately, deeply uh, prominent in our public conversations. So we're gonna challenge binaries too. That's another piece of it. Uh, challenge binaries across the board and think what does it mean to tackle these questions creatively and uh, in, in an invigorating way. We see you asked this question. That was uh, that was Jarrett. Jarrett, you see you asked a question that pushed us right against the hour. So that's a very good question. And also one that I took longer to answer than I, than I, than I wish I had, because there's a couple other uh, questions that we could we could pursue. We are against the uh, right up at, at time, and all of except for Austin, the rest of us in the room have to get to the MRPL seminar, which meets at six o'clock. So we are going to be late, um, but we're going to head out. And I just want to say thank you again for your presence with us. My invitation for you to reach out to me directly is a real one. Uh, we will schedule a Zoom call. We'll schedule time to talk about your individual aspirations if you feel like the MRPL is of interest to you. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for being with us. And I look forward to hopefully hearing from many of you in the room. And thank you, my wonderful colleagues in the room, for taking time to share your experiences with the MRPL. Good night, everyone. Good night, all. Thank you very much, everyone.